Turn with me, if you would, over to 1 Corinthians. And I want, you know, anytime I'm stumped for a subject to talk about, Jesus Christ always comes to mind, of course. You know, there's always plenty to talk about in regards to the Lord. And, uh, and we will indeed talk about him. But I want to begin here in chapter 13 of uh, 1 Corinthians because it's called the love chapter. And uh, Paul, of course, is the apostle to the Gentiles, but uh, Paul had more to say, really, and said it better than anyone else. And Paul, of course, raised up more churches than anyone else. Uh, I think you could make a good case for saying that Paul actually did more than the rest of them put together. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, of course. He's the great intellect of the New Testament. And Paul explains Christianity to us in ways that, that the others did not. The Apostle John had great insight about the person of the Lord Jesus, and uh, he's the one that tells us a lot about love. He's the one that tells us that God is love, of course. But it's Paul that really explains Christianity to us. And uh, our critics sometimes will refer to our Christianity as, well, say that's nothing more than Pauline teaching. That's Pauline Christianity. Well, I don't take offense to that because that's accurate. It is. Paul is the one who explains Jesus Christ to us. It's Paul who t teaches us that it's not law or grace, but that it is law and grace. And that uh, is, the, is the understanding of all that Paul had to write in that, on that subject, of course. And he explains Christianity to us in more profound and in-depth ways than, than anyone else. And he was chosen out of time and out of sync with the others, of course. And we know about that story. It was a great miracle. Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. And I always, I always love to tell the story about Paul's conversion because it's such a powerful testimony, such a powerful event. You know, Paul, uh, I, I think I raised the ire of some people and some eyebrows were raised the first time someone ever heard me uh, say to an audience that Paul was twisted inside and corrupted full of hate. How dare I say that about Paul? Well, that is the fact. Paul was trying to stamp out Christianity. He hated Jesus Christ, he hated Christianity, and he was either a member of the Sanhedrin or employed by the Sanhedrin and commissioned by them and sent on errands by them to hunt down those Christians and to, to get rid of them, as it were. He was a messenger of an evolving Judaism, as it were, rabbinic Judaism. And they were trying to stamp out this stuff about Messiah and Jesus Christ. And Paul had been commissioned to have people arrested. Paul was personally culpable in people being arrested and tortured and in some cases put to death. That's the Apostle Paul. He did that because his heart was wrong. He did that out of a self-righteous, twisted idea. And the Lord Jesus Christ met him on the road to Damascus and said, Paul, why are you doing this to me? He said, who are you, Lord? And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but Paul was struck blind by the, the brilliance of the Lord. The, the glory that emanated from the Lord was brighter than the sun, Paul said. And they all were struck down, fell on the ground, and, and Paul ended up being blind as a result for a few days. But we know the story. Paul was indeed converted. And Jesus Christ said, Paul, you're going to be a special vessel to me, a special servant. And indeed, he was. And Paul tells us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about something that is very cogent to us as Christians. Anyone who professes to be a Christian needs to really have a, a, an in-depth understanding of what we're being told here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because... You can know this book backwards and forwards. You can do all kinds of good works. You can be generous. You can feed the poor. You can do all kinds of great things in the name of Christ. You can have all the religiosity and churchified words and actions. But if you don't meet what Paul says here, then it's 
It's worthless. It really is in vain. And it, goes, it really goes along with what the Lord said, uh, as, as quoted in Mark chapter 7 there, you know, that your, your worship, irrespective of how sincere it might be for you, no, no matter how emotional it might be for you, no matter what you might be able to conjure up in terms of emotion, nevertheless, your worship for God must be in accordance with this book here and the way that God has, because God is God enough to tell us when to do it, how to do it, what it is, and so forth and so on. And what the consequence to us is when it's done wrong and what happens to us when it's done right. And Paul, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, tells us that this must happen for us. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, have not agape or agapeo, as it can be uh, understood as well, the verb or, or, the, or a noun. Though I speak with the tongues, the languages of men and of angels and have not agape love, charity, concern, giving, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And Paul did indeed speak with other languages. Paul had all of the gifts. He references that fact here, and I think people read over this and they, they miss the fact. Paul is not talking in, in uh, analogous terms or metaphorical terms here. He really does have the gifts. Paul had all of the gifts. And we have scripture that, that make it clear. Paul had raised people from the dead. Paul had been bitten by a viper, which is uh, another word for a, a, a cobra. Uh, I mean, Paul had all of the gifts, the, the gifts of language, all of that. He was full of God's Holy Spirit in ways that I'm not and that you are not. He had all of the gifts. As Christians, we are assured that we have one or more of the gifts. If you have the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, this book guarantees that you have at least one or more of the gifts of the Spirit. A lot of people never exercise those gifts. They never discover those gifts. Uh, sometimes we're challenged by being led to the podium and said, now speak to God's people and find out that maybe you do have some of those gifts. But Paul had them all. Though I speak with the languages of men and angels and have not charity, if I don't have love, if I don't have that outgoing concern, if that's not happening in me, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's, it's just noise and it's discordant and it's not even harmonious. And though I have the gift of prophecy, though he did, that's what he's saying here, he had the gift, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, he understood the mysterion of God. And Paul, Paul later goes on to say that we look darkly through a glass and that we know in part. But there were some things Paul was not even allowed to, to talk about. And I'll just reference for your memory, students of the Bible, that it was Paul, and I'll just paraphrase, you remember that Paul referenced himself as another individual, and he said, I knew of a man 14 years ago, whether it really happened or was it a vision, I, I really don't know, but I suppose he was in heaven or was he in heaven, and he heard things and saw things, wonderful things, some of which he couldn't talk about, and some that he could. And, and Paul was talking about himself, of course. And so Paul evidently, had seen the mysterion of God revealed in ways that perhaps he d was not allowed to, to share in total with us. And I've pondered that, wondered about that, just as a little sidebar here, and perhaps you have as well. But you know what? I think that God tells us what he wants us to know, what he has determined that we need to know based upon the, the quality and quantity of gray matter that he has given us, and I think, I think that, the, that the full vision of God's mysterion is so magnificent, so beyond our scope, that we simply are not intellectually equipped at this point to handle such information. Uh, it's too wonderful, as it were. And David, some of the revelations of David, he said, it's just too wonderful to know. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, the mysterions of God, and have all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. 
Again, this is not just an analogous situation. Now, Paul's not talking about what if I had these. Paul is telling us he's got these gifts. And he had that kind of faith that he could move a mountain. Paul had raised people from the dead. I, I submit to you that raising someone from the dead is a, is a far bigger deal than even moving a mountain. <laughs> and so Paul knew what he was talking about here. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. And there is a possibility that Paul ended up, you know, on a, on a, a stake being burnt alive. The consensus is, and it, and it probably is the right one, is that Paul eventually lost his head in Rome. He was probably beheaded. You know, but, but he's, he's telling us something that's very important for us. You can have all the trappings of Christianity. You can say the right things and look the right way and behave the right way and have all the, all the evidence of Christianity outwardly. But if it's not in here, then it, it profits nothing. And then he goes on to tell us what it's really like here in verse uh, 4. Charity that is the outgoing godly concern, that's what the word agape is, it suffers long. That is, it doesn't run out of patience. And isn't that a message for the day and age in which we live about patience? I want patience and I want it right now. You know, isn't that the way we are? Yeah. And we live in, a, we live in a, a, an age of instant gratification. And there's so many gadgets that gratify us and so many things in our, in our fast-paced life that gratify us right away, and we've become programmed. And we're all, it's, you know, it's happened to all of us, you know. And when, like if you flip that switch and nothing happens, ooh, that's the way we are. And that's why road rage abounds. You know, more and more you see stories in the news where people get into fist fights and shoot each other and, you know, fender benders and, and uh, incidents at red lights and all that. A few years ago when Sandy and I were in Australia, Australia has few traffic lights. It's full of what they call roundabouts. And there's, there's more and more of them in this country, it seems. And there's some in Canada as well. But uh, at that time, uh, I wasn't aware of any uh, in this country, really. And a number of people inquired of, of us while we were there what, what we thought about their roundabouts. And I said, well, I think you Australians are actually more civilized than us Americans. I think this would uh, be the source of fistfights in America, you know, as, as to who's going to have access in the, in the roundabout, you know. And uh, I said that in a, you know, to, to try and be funny and elicit laughter, but I think there's some truth to that, and we all understand that, you know. We're, we're an impatient people, a stiff-necked, rebellious people, and we're impatient. And, and a lack of patience is one of our biggest problems in this country. You know. Charity suffers long. It's not impatient. doesn't run out of patience. What would happen if God ran out of patience? And if anybody deserved to run out of patience, of course, it'd be God. You know, what must he think when he looks down here and sees all the stuff that's going on, especially the stuff that's going on in his name? Yeah. And he looks down here... You know, if it was a human, if it was any human who's ever lived with the exception of Jesus Christ, it would have already been over with. Somebody would have lost their patience and pushed the button, as it were. Yes. But God is long-suffering. And that's what we're trying to learn. And it's kind. Yes, it's, it's generous. It's kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself. It's not puffed up. I'm just so pleased. I'm like that guy that Luke talked about, you know. I'm not like other, I'm glad I'm not like other men. I tithe and I fast and I'm always there. Anybody know Christians like that? Yeah. And the other guy, he wouldn't even lift his eyes up. He knew what he was. There was no pretense. He just smote his own breast you know, and asked for forgiveness. And the scripture tells us that he went away justified and the hypocrite, well, he wasn't justified, to say the least. Charity does not behave itself unseemly. There's a way to act and behave. If you're going to profess to be a Christian, that suggests a certain type of behavior, a certain type of kindness, a certain type of patience, a certain type of 
conversation, a certain demeanor, a certain way to dress even, a certain way to look. Not unseemly. It seeks not its own, not its own will. And isn't that the narcissistic culture that we have today? Everybody wants it their way, you know. What, what was that Burger King commercial? Have it your way, yes? But I mean, you could extrapolate that to almost every aspect of life in this country. Have it your way, yes. It's not easily provoked. Oh boy, not easily provoked. Yeah. I'm not easily provoked either, as long as you agree with me. It, but isn't that the way it is? You, if you, it's hard to have a, a conversation now where it's a give and take of ideas if you can't, you can't express your idea anymore because the, the person you're expressing it to, if they don't believe the, the exact same things that you believe, there's a good chance you might be in a fist fight before you know it. It's just the way it is in this culture. And you know what? Sometimes that even spills over into church, doesn't it? And people will excommunicate each other <laughs> and pick up their marbles and go start another little group somewhere <laughs> to just pick up the marbles and move again later on. You know. how, many, how many Church of God groups do we have now? The latest count, I know it was over 400. It does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, you know, I remember a scandal in the church a few years ago. You know, the church has been plagued with scandals of a sexual nature and, and, a, and a, you know, corruption because of money nature and all kinds of things. The whole 2000 history of the church, it's, it's just full of stories like that, unfortunately. But it was prophesied that that would be the case. But I remember how some individuals who will remain nameless just seem to revel in the disaster that one of their brothers experienced. And, the, and, and, and of course, the damage to the church is still happening. And many of you already know what I'm talking about. I didn't even have to mention names. Yeah. But I remember a few years ago that a lot of people looked at a, a visual record of a brother's sins. You know, I wouldn't look at it. I'm not saying that because I'm holier than anybody else. You know. But I remembered this. I'm required to think good of my brother, not evil. And I'm required to hide his sin or put his sin in such a way that it's, it's not something I want to celebrate or show everybody else. Why would you want to look at your brother's shame, your brother's sin? He's a brother who's in trouble. I've never, I've never quite understood the motivation for some people why they would want to do that, you know. And if, the, and if the brother that I'm talking about, the one you know that I'm talking about, I want to tell you something. If he can't find forgiveness, if he can't repent, then neither can you. If there is, if there is no repentance for him, if there's no forgiveness for him, then you might as well quit coming to church because you're in a big jam too, yes. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Yeah, whatever comes down the road, you know. Maybe it's my pugnacious nature, you know. Carnality still resides in the best, best among us, which I am not. <laughs> but as a, as a Christian in the conversion process, I'm very much aware of the carnality that still resides in me, you know, and the pugnacious, natural way that I used to be. And I'd be, I'd, I would just simply be dishonest to say that some of that is, it's still there, you know. I'm, I'm trying to get over that. I'm trying to get well. That's what conversion's all about, isn't it? It's trying to be less like us and more like Jesus Christ, you know. Well, my way to meet the stuff in life as it come towards me was to knock it out and fight it and punch it and that's, that was me, you know. And you know, if that included people, well, that all the more I enjoy it, you know, just, well, that of course is part of the stuff that we have to bury, right? Isn't that what baptism's about? Putting that mortality to rest? 
putting on a new man, thinking a new way, learning to respond to life differently, learning to meet life's problems differently, always being aware that there's, there's part of me that wants to do it my way, but I have the vision of Christ's way. You know, so that is the struggle, of course. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails. Outgoing love, agape, it doesn't fail. It doesn't quit. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And I want to pause here now and begin to comment on some of these words because they're of great, great significance in terms of our doctrine. The word fail here is kartageo in the Greek, and it doesn't mean fail. And I've had conversations with people in the church that uh, insist that some of the end time prophecies, some of the eschatology uh, that this book portrays will not happen, it's going to fail, and they, they might cite this to support that incorrect premise. All that has proceeded from the mouth of God was, was eternally correct and true at the moment it was, it was said. And, and the God who does not change and who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we must extrapolate that concept to everything that he has said and this record that he has provided for us and understand that prophecy has a reason and a purpose. And the word kartageo does not mean fail, it has a distinctly different me uh, meaning. It means to gradually fade away or to diminish entirely or to vanish away or cease to be as it happens, as it's fulfilled. That's what it means. The very idea that a, and th another one that they will cite of course is uh, uh, when, when Jonah went and, and preached to, uh, somebody tell me, Nineveh. Nineveh. And they say, well, Jonah said that Nineveh was going to be destroyed, and that prophecy failed. No, it didn't. Go back and reread it, students of the Bible. They repented, and so God didn't destroy them as long as their repentance lasted. But every word of the prophecy came true ultimately because they backslid, and Nineveh became a dung heap, just like God said. No. Prophecies are given from the one who cannot lie. Prophecies may cartageo, they may, they may gradually be gone, they may gradually fail, they may gradually cartageo as they have served their purpose, as they are fulfilled, they can vanish away. But God didn't give any prophecy just to fill up space here. Let me continue. Whether there be tongues, whether there be languages, and here's a great source of confusion for a lot of people. In the King James Bible, it talks about unknown tongues, and you'll find that that's italicized. That's not in the original. It's not in any original. It's not in any copy of an original uh, manuscript. None whatsoever. It is supplied by the translators to imply a language that is not, that you, someone doesn't speak or doesn't understand when they hear. It's not, it's not, this is not uh, giving us validation for mumbo jumbo gibberish. This is talking about a real language. The word is glossa and it is the word used in association with language. Whether there be languages, they shall cease. And after this point, as we go through Paul's writings to the Corinthians, the examples of that cease, and there's no more of it. None whatsoever. The gift of speaking in languages, though I'm going to hit heat over this, the gift of languages in the body of Christ does not exist at the present. And it has not, in all likelihood, since the Apostle John died. The word here is, whether there shall be tongues, they shall cease. And the word is peuo, peuo, and that word literally means to quit, to stop, to cease, to go away. 
That's the way it is used in other Greek grammatical constructions. It doesn't even mean to eventually kartageo away. It means to peuo away. It means to stop, to end, to come to an end. And that's the only way that word can be used in a Greek grammatical construction. It means to stop. And it has. It stopped. It served its purpose. It was part of the miracle working church starting on the day of Pentecost. The miracles were there for a reason. When, when the more than 500 people were witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that they, some of them saw him after his death. That's a very tiny, small percentage of people. What caused the exponential growth of the church was the miracles, the miracles of Pentecost and other subsequent miracles who were able, that, and the miracles validated the, the fact of the resurrection, of course. It was the miracles of language. It was the miracles of the speaking and the hearing. Paul was able to go all over the known world, perhaps even to Britain and other places, Spain and other places, and speak the language of the people there. He could go there and preach because he had the gift of languages. There's evidence that some of the apostles went all the way to India and places like that, and they spoke the language by the, as the gift of God, and they, their audience understood them. Those gifts no longer exist in the church. They're not needed anymore. We have the full record of God's written text here in the New Testament. But they served their purpose. As a result of the miracles of language on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were instantly converted and changed and were baptized that day because of the miracle that happened that day. And the other subsequent miracles, as we read through the book of Acts, the things that are described here, these gifts, Paul worked miracles through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Peter and James and the others were able to perform miracles. And they had the, the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in ways that you or I do not have it. We have an earnest, as it were, of that Spirit. We can get more of it. The program that God has laid out for us enables us to acquire more of that Spirit, to be converted and become more and more Spirit-filled. But you're not full of God's Holy Spirit. When I came up from the waters of baptism and had hands laid on me, this book assures me, and I believe with all the body of my being, that I received God's Holy Spirit. And I believe that about you. But it was a down payment, we're told. Payment on account, in lieu of final payment. Literally, that's what the Greek in, implies. But on the day of Pentecost, these individuals that we're talking about here, they were full of God's Holy Spirit. They were pleuro, that is the Greek word, and it means full capacity. And I've, I've explained that before by talking about a glass of water. If you fill it to the point where it starts overflowing, that's pleuro. When, when, when the entire volume is now full, and only then has pleuro happened. The, the house they were in was pleuro of this sound, and it was pleuro of that wind, and they were pleuro of God's Holy Spirit. It means full to capacity, no room for anything else. That's what it means. Peter had that. Paul had that. They had that. We don't have that. Peter was so full of God's Holy Spirit that he could exercise the gift of healing as it pleased Peter to do it. For Peter to make the choice to heal or not to heal, he had, he had that gift. Remember the story of when Peter encountered the lame man at the temple, the beggar? And he said, silver or gold, I don't have you. It was almost like an afterthought. He saw this guy and he stopped. Well, I don't have any silver or gold to give you, but what I have I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And the man leapt up and was healed and was astounded. Well, consider this. If you were that man, and what do you think that man would do? Do you think he probably tried to follow Peter around everywhere that Peter went? Do you think that he wanted to hear more about this power that Peter had? Do you think he wanted to hear, if I were able, or you were able, to go to the hospital today, if I was able right today to go back right today and lay hands on Bob Baker, and, and say, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. And if Bob sat up and said, gee, I'm hungry, give me something to eat. You know. 
I guarantee you everybody in that hospital would want to know about Wayne Hendricks' theology. They'd want to know what I believe and what I teach if they saw that. Well, that's what happened, and that's why these gifts were given. And the church exploded with people. It's estimated that in Paul's lifetime, by the time he died, there was probably a million or more Christians. And it was because they were full of God's Holy Spirit, not only in example, but in their miracle-working ability. And the church got its start, and it preserved the writings in the New Testament because of it. Whether there be prophecies, they shall cartigale. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish. It shall cartigale away again. And we understand things that they knew as, it, as, as the apostle John died somewhere around the year 100, when he was about 100, certain things died with John that no one has known since then. And he was indeed the last apostle irrespective of the fact that there's a number of Christian denominations that claim to have apostles. No, you don't. When John died, there weren't any more apostles. He was personally, literally, physically in the presence of Jesus Christ, and that's one of the qualifications for being an apostle. And nobody since then has been. We know in part, verse 9, and we prophesy in part, yes, even Paul was willing to admit we don't know everything. We don't know every detail. We don't have the mind of God in full. We're trying to acquire the mind of Christ. And God has put a program in place that enables us to acquire that mind, to get more and more of it. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, the perfect Lord Jesus Christ, and our meeting with him when we will be perfect, there's going to be a moment in time when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air where we will go from being imperfect to perfect. Now that's a concept that's hard for me to get my mind around. And I suspect it is for you as well. But the scripture is very clear. This corruptible, in the present tense, and that's what Paul's writing to the Corinthians was about, this corruptible must put on incorruption. Paul's referencing himself in, those, in that writing. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. There's going to be a moment in time when we will meet Christ, and as we meet him, it will be an exhilarating experience. It will be an experience so magnificent that it will change us, seeing him, comprehending him, comprehending who and what he is in totality, intellectually, emotionally, intuitively, instinctively, in every kind of possible way. We will see him as he is, the scripture tells us, and because we do, it will change us and we will be like him. We will become utterly changed. A transformation will take place and a lasso in the Greek will take place. A metamorphosis will take place. And we will go from the human kind to the divine kind. And we will no longer from that moment forward be corruptible. And from that moment forward we will be immortal. And from that moment forward, we're told in the book of Revelation, we will be holy. <laughs> yes. That is the gospel story. Hard to get your mind around that, isn't it? Anybody here holy yet? No, got a long way to go. But God's got this all, all programmed out. He knows what he's doing. And there's going to be a moment in time when we will go over a threshold and we will become like Jesus Christ in reality. It says we will be like him. We will see him as he is. And it will have a profound impact upon us. When we see him and comprehend him, it will ultimately forever change us and we will be like him. Yes, that's what we look forward to. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Yes, everything about us on the carnal end will be gone, and we will indeed be holy. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I'm a man in the faith now. Genera a generation has gone by. Decades have gone by. I, uh, I, I consider myself, I'm 73 years old, but I consider myself, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, 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 I'm egotistical enough to say that I'm now 21 in the faith. 
I've reached adulthood, but how many 21-year-olds have you known who really knew very much? Uh, my apologies to any young people listening. Got a long way to go, don't we? And even after we become members of God's family, even after we meet Him in the air, isn't the analogy of, of children and family still intact for us? Won't it still be the same way? I believe it will. On that meeting with Jesus Christ, we will be like Him, but won't we have a lot to learn from that moment forward? Won't we have a lot of maturing to do from that moment forward? Yes, indeed we will. And our learning will no longer be obstructed by the laws of physics. Our learning will no longer be obstructed by the fact that we get tired. <laughs> our learning will now be enhanced by the fact that we will be like Him. Verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Yes. You know, uh, I was recently up in uh, Canada and recently in Tyler, and I used this scripture to illustrate the, the fact that we, we know so much more now than we, than we did just a few decades ago. And uh, the, the fact is, there is an ongoing revelation in faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ, to His church. He's dealing with His church and He's dealing with us. It's God that's dealing with us, Paul tells us. And there are prophecies in God's Word that reveal the fact to us that our knowledge will increase. You know, well, it's not talking about technical knowledge or, the, you know, knowledge about real estate. It's talking about the knowledge of God's Word. That is the subject matter being referenced here about what we know in part. It's increasing. We know a great deal more now. And we've been looking through that glass for 2,000 years. Have you ever been in a house at night and the lights are on, it's dark outside, and perhaps you hear a noise outside. And you go up to the window and put your face up there like this. We've all done it, haven't we? You know what I'm talking about. And you look outside, and for a second or two, it, it's, it's out of focus. And your eyes have to get accustomed, don't they? Yes. And, and you look through there, and then you begin to, to see in the dark out there. Well, there's, you know, there's cars and maybe there's people and there's trees. You begin to see stuff more and more clearly. And as you continue to look, it, it's amazing how much you can see out there. Well, we've been looking through there that way now for 2,000 years, and we're starting to see a lot real clear. And, and that is, that is the, the metaphor here. We see a lot more now than we did just a few years ago. Yes. And... Uh, that's, that's evident uh, all around us, I believe, that we are indeed understanding more and more. We, we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even also as I am known. And now abides, abides faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So, brethren, that's, that's my somewhat abbreviated message I have for you today. Uh, conversion has to happen. And as a result of that, there's got to be agape here. God's Holy Spirit is sowing love in us. There is a great spirit who is sowing love in us so that we will be recognized and recognize Him. God be with you.